November 6, 2014 is an important milestone date in our history, our 35th anniversary of our establishment of a transit district. Much has changed over the years, but what hasn't changed is the loyalty and dedication of the men and women who work here. As part of celebrating our 35th anniversary, we are honoring our history. I'm excited to bring you this video as we look back over the past 35 years. To the men and women of the board and district, past and present, I salute you for a job well done. To the men and women of the future, I challenge you to continue our legacy and make tomorrow better than today. To our customers, thank you for riding because you are why we are here. Well, let's take a look back at the past 35 years. Well, I was hired uh, November 28th, 1972. And uh, in those days, hiring was a real simple system. A gentleman by the name of Ernie Wynn was the gentleman that hired me. And my road test to become an operator was real simple. He said, can you drive that 30-foot bus? And I said, yes, I can. And he says, get in the seat and let's go. It was about a 10-minute run. All we did was uh, uh, he made sure I stayed between the, the white lines and I could curb. So we drove a half a mile and he says, yep, you can drive it. You're hired. Three and a half days later, I was driving bus by myself. In those days, it's interesting that there was nothing written down. There was no handbooks, there was no memorandums. Everything was what I call oral tradition. We wore a green blazer and black wool pants. Whether it was 95 degrees or 20 degrees, we wore black wool pants. We had white short sleeve shirts and a, and a black clip-on tie, which when it got to be 75 degrees, we could take off. So we always look forward to 75 degrees and we can take off our clip tie. At 11.45, all the buses stopped at Corton High and that's when it was our lunchtime. And there was no lunchroom, by the way, back then. We had no bathrooms to go to. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty uh, crude. Ernie would stand at the corner of Corton High and he would twirl his finger like this. And that's meant it was time to leave. And so things they haven't changed. Al Hampton went around the country buying old buses and we rehabilitated them in the shop so we could run them to haul all the people that we had because of the gas crisis. The, our buses were just running jam-packed full. The only problem was when he bought these buses, the, <laughs> they were 40 foot and they would not, even the 35 foot would not fit in the two bays that we had. So the city added like a doghouse affair to the shop that stuck out so we could get the buses in out of the weather, but the hoist would only pick up one end at a time, which was a real hassle. When I first hired on, everything was already antiquated. We're looking at 20 plus years. We're looking at the old Grumman's buses, the old Toraflow buses. We're looking at the uh, new looks, supposedly new looks that were 20 years old. And it was two-speed transmission, and basically everything was mechanical. The first buses were very primitive. Uh, they were a good workhorse, uh, they did the job, and they, actually they were a little bit narrower, believe it or not, than the newer buses, so we could squeeze in between tight places. That was a good thing. These were old buses, you know, they were experienced when I got there, you know. <laughs> one year, we, we had to replace uh, an engine in one of our old buses, uh, and this engine, once it was installed, it sounded marvelous, it just had a great sound to it. But we found out that it had a difficult time getting up hills. On this particular occasion, I had a busload of people going up Salem Heights Hill very steep hill here in town. And uh, unfortunately, somebody needed off in the middle of that stretch, and so I, I needed to stop and let them off, which I did. But I found out that after that, I couldn't get the bus moving uh, to get up to the rest of the hill, the length of the hill. So I had to ask 10 to 15 people to deboard while the bus could make it to the top, and then they had to walk uh, to catch up with me, or I reboarded them and off we went. But uh, yeah, that was kind of unusual. We had these buses that had, they were bought from Toronto, Canada. They were trolley buses, and they had two seats on one side and one seat on the other, and a huge aisle. They looked like a bowling alley down the middle. They were 40 foot, 102 inch coaches. And I saw, over, I think 100 people get off one of them one time at Lancaster Mall. And it was a crazy, crazy time. Um, they had just hired 13 drivers. And we used to do time cards by hand back then. 
and it was so bad that I finally said, let me fill them out and if you trust me, just sign it because it took me way past closing time to try to verify all these time cards. Some of them were like three or four pages long, what they did all day long. If you got in trouble on your route, a meaning bus trouble, uh, you didn't have any radios to call in, what you would do is uh, just uh, stop at a, at, the not, at a closest house and knock on the door and use their telephone. Of course, there was no cell phones back then. So you had to interrupt an old couple having breakfast or whatever and ask to use a telephone, and they did. It was no problem back then. I just started with the city fixing the buses, and uh, I was on this bus fixing something on the dash, and pretty soon my knee went through this piece of glass that held a fire extinguisher. Oh, I was just devastated. I went home and told, told my wife, Loris, if they're gonna fire me, I broke this. Man, it's my first, you know, my first week. It was just terrible. I went back to work the next day and I seen that half of these windows had already been broken out of the buses and I felt a lot better. But uh, it was one of the, <laughs> quite a learning experience. 1980, we got these new RTS buses and uh, oh, they were a dream bus to us. And they had power steering, all of them. They had a wonderful heating system. There were a few that had air conditioning, and as we got more as the time went on, they had wheelchair lifts. Now, when I first heard that we would be hauling wheelchairs, I could not believe it. I mean, how in the world are you going to get a wheelchair on a city bus? But they found a way, and uh, they loaded uh, through the rear. It was rare to pick up a wheelchair a lot of times, maybe once or twice a week, as now sometimes it's once or twice a route. I got involved with the district because Kent Aldrich, who was the mayor, set up a task force for transit to create a structure because the city was operating the buses, but they were going outside the city limits. At a function, he asked me if I'd be willing to serve on any sort of a committee, and I said, well, maybe, and he said, well, that's good because I want young and single people to be involved in city committees in Salem. And as the transit district was formed, and we went from doing the same thing with a new name, I remember Al Hampton coming in saying, if you work on buses, if you don't have an issue with it, we're gonna transfer you to the transit district. Back in 1979, when I became part of the transit district, that's when we were formed, I went ahead and we were reporting out at the City Public Works. And at City Public Works, we had a little building out there on Oxford at 25th called Fort Apache. It was a little yellow house and it had a little vestibule that you walked inside. You opened up the door and you took out your pocket knife and you cut your way through the smoke in the room because it was, you couldn't see 12 foot in front of you. And we went from working in two bays to when we moved to the facility on Del Webb, you know, we wondered how are we ever going to fill this place up? It is so huge. Before I retired, we had to add four more bays, and what I've heard, they're going to have to add more. Then in 1986, Signe Pribno Lawrence, who was chair of the committee, came to me and said, we need a tax base for the district so that the district wasn't operating on two-year levies, because you can't do long-term planning on just two-year levies. So Signe and I worked the campaign over her dining room table. We didn't have a whole bunch of money, but I think we ran a credible campaign and having that tax base established was really, really important. The biggest thing that happened, however, uh, was the construction of Courthouse Square. The streets are for traffic and, uh, and buses need a home of their own, so they did a number of studies in the 70s and 80s. Uh, all of those studies pointed to the same place, the Senator Block at Court and High Street. But they could never garner enough political support in the 1990s after 20 years of studies and, and um, efforts to try and get something going. R.G. Anderson Wyckoff became the transit manager. Uh, his first day was September 1st, 1995. By December, R.G. had uh, gotten the support of Marion County, he'd gotten the support of the city of Salem, which was a, a real tough nut to crack. And he got the Chamber of Commerce and downtown businesses to support the, the whole concept. It was completed by September of 2000. It came in uh, on time and on budget. 
A huge project, a lot of uh, community input, and uh, a, a tremendous amount of pride on the part of the transit district. And I do remember the old days when we would take off, and I'd look in my mirror and see a big black puff of smoke, and I know it irritated people behind us, but now, of course, um, that's all in the past. Basically, all that's coming out of there now is water. You see a vapor cloud come out instead of this black soot. The door's opening up immensely with the alternative fuels that we have. We're looking at fuel cells, we're looking at you know, hydrogen. It's all electric, it's hybrid. Compressed natural gas and everything else. Um, everything is pretty much controlled by a computer today. In the beginning, we had our road call box. It had hoses and belts in it. Today, you go out with a laptop computer to talk to the bus to make it run. Just since I was there, we started shuttles to Wilsonville and out to the Grand Ronde and, and little interconnections and wherever people are trying to get to. It's amazing. For the first time a couple of years ago, we had a fleet that was all within its useful life. And that's exciting for somebody in transit because it means less maintenance money and more service on the road. There are so many different stories that could go on with transit, you know, and the things that we've seen and done over the years. Uh, it was just nice to be part of all that change and actually see it occur. The transit district needs to be seen by all of the players in Salem as a major and productive part of a healthy community. I was asked one question when I hired on by Al Hampton, and his question to me was, will you promise me 18 months? And I said, yes. And 39 years and six months later, I'm still here. The drivers are great. Haven't been in a city in this country where we have better drivers. I was the first person as a supervisor to be hired who was never a driver beforehand. Thanks to the group of guys that I worked with who rallied around me and if it hadn't been for them, I wouldn't have made it. 19 years in this transit, you know, the support I got, it's just amazing. My wife and I were coming in from Bend and we were coming over the hill at Joseph Street and I had an opportunity to look over the city and there was a kind of a brown haze. And I, at that point it occurred to me that I was involved in something that was helping that situation. And at that point it became something other than just a paycheck for me. I made many, many wonderful friends over the years and uh, it was a, a great 40 years, although I am really glad to be retired. I still feel like I'm a, a charioteer uh, emeritus, I call myself. So it's been a, it's been a good ride.